What's up, y'all? I'm Alan Hayne, the Lawn Care Nut. Welcome to Lawns Across America, episode 36. I know it's been another couple weeks since I got one out, and uh, happy to be back. Just so you guys know, I really miss doing the podcasts. These are actually some of my favorite content that I put out. It's just they're also some of the most time-consuming, because I do have to do quite a bit of preparation and then some technical stuff to do ahead of time, transfer stuff here, there, get music, do this, do that. And then I have to actually research some of the answers sometimes because I don't know everything. Happy to admit that. But really glad to be back. I do feel that I like this format the most. And another reason it takes so long to do it is because I'm able to flesh out topics in a lot deeper of a manner. I'm able to go into things in a lot different way than I do in my videos on YouTube. So really happy to be able to be back and producing another podcast for you. I want to start out with a funny story. I think most of you like when I tell funny stories or stories of things, and (laughs) I thought I would tell this one. So uh, a few weeks ago, I did uh, the collab with the millennial farmer. His name is Zach Johnson, and he's got a farming channel up over by there in Minnesota over there, and uh, he does, he farms corn and soybeans. Just a great guy. I've been a fan for a long time, major fanboy, and he and I have, you know, uh, done things on Instagram or whatever. He's really very responsive on Instagram. And in fact, if you go to his Instagram, I think he uses Instagram in the best way possible in that he and other Instagrammers create conversations through it. It's really awesome the way they use stories. I've never seen it used like that before. I really like that. So I got to know him a little bit on there and then I'd leave some comments on some of his live videos and he would talk back that way. And then over time, I was able to put together this collab where we went out and seeded his dad's property. And by the way, I have some results of that, which I'll show you right here. If you're on the YouTube channel for Lawns Across America, you can see some of the growth we've gotten. We do have a few areas that have washed out, though. So he's got to send me some more pictures of that. Areas, uh, some higher up pictures. He sent me low pictures because <laughs> I think he knew those would be better to show results, which is awesome. But I need to see overall everything um, because if they had a couple areas that washed out or whatever, which happens when you seed, especially uh, where he lives, they get these uh, pretty pretty hardcore downpours. So we're going to need to get them a little more seed to fill in things. And that's one of the things you got to do when you seed. You have to expect that you're going to have some areas that wash out. It's just it is what it is. So figured I would uh, share that with you. But I wanted to share a story that came along with that when we were there because when we were there for the three days we were there, I mean, we were literally having fun cutting up the whole time, just him and his dad have a great sense of humor in his family. And so me and my business partner, Josh, we were there working alongside of them for all those hours and just having a lot of time, fun times joking around. And uh, so I went in uh, at the end of day two, uh, we were uh, getting ready to go out and uh, and have a little something to eat. And so before we did that, I went to in their garage In his garage, he has like a slop sink, right? So I went to, we all were doing that, going to wash our hands there. And I went in and there was this there was soap there, but there was also this kind of white, porous looking rock. And I believe I might have a picture of it. If I do, I'll put it up on YouTube. But there was this kind of white looking rock, kind of like, I, I don't know if soapstone is an actual thing. I think it is. But if I was going to describe this, it would be a soapstone. And I was like, you know, and I just, this is just me. So I start thinking to myself, I bet you that rock is to scrub your hands with. I bet you, these are farmers, right? These guys are practical. They're smart. They have tips and tricks for everything but most of all they're practical like why would they have to buy pumice hand cleaner and waste money on pumice hand cleaner because farmers are super smart and they would find a way to use something that's renewable that costs nothing to wash your hands with rather than having to spend money on pumice soap because they are they keep their budgets that tight that's my view of farmers right that's a positive view So I'm like, that must be what this rock is for. So I grabbed this rock, 
and I start using it. I put my hands under the water. I'm using this rock and I'm scrubbing my hands with this rock. And I'm like, dude, this thing is working great because it is. It's a porous white rock. And it, I'm scraping it on my hands and I'm not being gentle. You know, I got some man hands over by there. And uh, so I'm scraping. I'm like, man, this thing is taking all of the dirt off. This is awesome. And so I used that rock under the water and scraped all the dirt off my hands. And they were like, like brand new, like exfoliated. Like, just nice. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, this is great. So I decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and tell these guys that I am I understand how smart they are, and I'm going to compliment them on this. And so I go out, and I see Nate. That's uh, Zach's dad. I'm like, Nate, I said, I saw your your washing stone there next to the slop sink, and I used it. That's a really smart thing to do. Look at how good it did on my hands. And he kind of looked at me funny for just a split second, and he went, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're um, yeah, works great. And he like played along with me, and he kind of had this little smile, but then he played along with me. And so I went to Zach. I'm like, yeah, man, that was great. And he looks at me. He's like, that's not a soapstone. <laughs> hey, what rock are you talking about? I'm like, the rock that you have next to the sink. That you know, I'm sure that's why you don't have any pumice hand cleaner, any orange, orange rocky goo or whatever I don't, I don't know orange clean or whatever you don't you have that rock there right they're like mm-hmm. no <laughs> probably one of the kids found it in the lake and thought it was cool and just put it next to the sink and they're gonna wash it off and take it in the house you know like kids collect rocks <laughs> and here i was thinking it was some smart farmers um some smart farmers trick for washing your hands so i just thought it was funny how nate kind of played along with me like yeah Sure, I'm a smart farmer if you say I am. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. So, all right, let's jump right into the tips. Now, the first tip I want to give you today is one that is for cool season. I got a lot of warm season stuff in here too, but for my cool season friends, most of you now are out of your summer problems. Uh, I was talking to my friends over by Northwest Indiana, and their lawns have been cooked, bruh, cook, cook, cooked. But uh, finally getting some rain now, so things are going to start coming out. Talked to my father-in-law in Crown Point. He said he's finally got rain. He says lawn didn't green up yet because uh, I don't think the lawn believes it, but it's going to be soon. So when that happens, when you guys, no matter where you live, as your lawn is coming into fall here and as your lawn is starting to green up, when you see areas that don't green up, the very first thing you need to do is go and dig right between the brown and the green and look for grubs. Please do that. That is the biggest thing that I... Or, The biggest admonition I have for you or or warning is that those areas could be grubs, and this is when they're going to do the most damage because the grubs move slow in the summer too. They're still eating and everything, but if your soil is dry and hard because you can't water it, then that means the grubs aren't able to move either. Now, they'll still do some feeding, and that's what these dead spots are, but as the fall comes in, their um, body clocks, body clock? Their body clocks kick in, their nature clocks kick in and tell them, okay, Winter is coming. You have got to store up for the winter yourself, Mr. Grubworm, so you have the energy to pupate and become an adult. Mama Junebug, Papa Junebug, whatever Junebug, next uh, late spring, next May, June. So you got to eat your little patookas off here through the fall. So that's what the Grubworms do is they start eating, 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 and they will do more damage from now until October and into November than they will any other time of the year. So you still have kind of this chance to catch them now early. Now, even if you put down a grub preventative, I still want you to dig in those areas. Likely, you won't have them, and it could be something else, but these applications do fail when we have extremes in weather. You know, these uh, these different products that you buy for different things, pre-emergence or for grub preventative, all these, they're meant to work in what you might call air quotes normal conditions but this year was not normal so a lot of things will fail because of that extremes always break down they break down more than just you and your grass they'll break down the products you use there's a lot of a lot of things that uh, a lot of fallout that happens when you have extreme years extreme rain or extreme heat in this case or whatever so you want to check but for sure, if you didn't do a grub preventative, you want to check those brown spots. Now, don't ha- you don't have to tell me, I think it's grubs. If it's grubs, you will find them. That's the thing with most insect problems in the lawn is you don't have to guess, oh, I think this is grubs. No, you'll find them. You dig, you'll find them. They look like a little white shrimp under the lawn. Now, if you find one or two, it may not be necessarily a concern, but finding one or two means you better dig longer and find more. But 
typically if you find one or two, there's more where there's smoke, there's fire kind of deal. Um, so make sure you're digging around looking and that's what it could be. And if it is grubs, you want to put down a 24 hour grub control. Just go to any Home Depot Lowe's Ace. They will have something labeled 24 hour grub killer. I always use the term Dilox as an active ingredient, but I don't know if people are using that anymore. That might be old chemistry, I think. And I don't want to name chemistries that you should look for. Um, you know, Arena. Arena is a very expensive um, insecticide that works really well for grubs. But there's there's probably others. Just, again, whatever's listed for post-emergent grub control, post-emergent, <laughs> for um, reactive or curative grub control application, 24-hour grub killer. Get that and throw her down. Okay, next I had, uh, I put a video out a couple weeks ago on leveling the lawn with sand, and I got a few people that wanted to uh, go into that a little bit deeper, look at that a little bit more. Now, if you haven't seen the video, I leveled, uh, well, the lawn tools did. I didn't really do much work on that, but uh, we put in some, we had some low spots in my zoysia. And when I say low, well, we're talking a good two to three inch buildup in the big spots that we did. And uh, I, I had to do that because I had my driveway replaced. I had new pavers put in, and then I had new sidewalks poured. During the time I had the sidewalks poured, I ran drainage underneath those. I've had a big problem with drainage, basically, on that side of my house. And I corrected it with putting in um, drains, surface drains, not French drains on that side, just surface drains because water was collecting up by the house. Those are videos I did a couple years ago. But I wasn't able to run that drain through and under the sidewalk. So what was happening was it was draining off it was going across the driveway, messing the driveway up, the pavers, messing up the sidewalks, everything else. So when I had the sidewalks replaced, I went ahead and moved that, ran that drainage to underneath. So that's piece. But the second piece of the drainage was over there. I needed to just get rid of these low spots because the water was getting into those low spots and then sitting there and then uh, leaching, seeping, whatever, out and again, getting out of the driveway. So if I could build the areas up, the water would never get there in the first place. It would stay back towards the swale between houses where it should have been. So that's why I did that leveling. So the long and the short of that is, though, is, is I buried the zoysia. I just was impatient with it, whatever. And I knew my zoysia was tough, and I didn't want torpedo grass to invade by scalping. So you can go and watch that whole video where I talk you through the thinking through it and why I did it. However, the way I leveled there is incorrect. You should not bury your grass completely, okay? Again, watch the video I did on leveling my zoysia. And it basically, the, the title is, Don't Do It This Way. <laughs> I have people call me out. This is wrong. This is not how you level a lawn. I'm like, did you read the title, bro? I thought people nowadays were just headline readers. I thought that's kind of how society worked. And I said it was the wrong way to level, but you still had to leave me a comment and tell me it was the wrong way. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to win in that situation, but yeah, it was the wrong way to do it. It's just the way I did it. And the zoysia came through because my zoysia is alpha, baby, because my zoysia is strong because my zoysia can find its way, fight its way through any challenge. And I firmly believe that. I've talked about that before. When you work with your lawn long enough, you start to have confidence in it. Kind of like if you're a, a fighter, if you're training a fighter. You know, when you train a fighter from the beginning, you don't know what the fighter's capabilities are. You don't necessarily want to push your fighter too hard. You do push the limits here and there. But after you've been with a fighter for 10 or 15 fights, now you're like, oh, I know what he can handle. I can push him harder into the deeper rounds because I know what he can handle. And that's how your grass is too. By the way, raising kids are that way too. You can give them bigger challenges. You know, when they're young, you don't challenge them too hard. You want to challenge them a little bit with things because you need them to grow. You need them to learn. But you don't challenge them the same way when they're nine that you do when they're 18. That's why there's a certain age that you have to be to go into the military, which is a great challenge. So I felt good that my grass could make it through. I knew how my zoysia would respond to certain stimuli. And I turned out to be right. But that isn't necessarily the case for all of you, and that is not the right way to level. So I want to get on this and say, the first thing is people challenged me on the use of sand. And they said that sand can cause an issue because you can get this layering effect and the sand can then become hydrophobic where it won't absorb water. And also the roots of the grass will only grow in the sand because it's easier for the roots to get through the sand so they just don't go through whatever clay is below. This would be in the case of most of you guys that have clay soil. There was a couple other things too. Oh, I know one guy was telling me that, you know, hey, those are areas where, you know, if you do that sand leveling there that when you fertilize, those areas will go pale quicker. And there's an element of truth to all of that. 
and I can't argue with it, but I need you to understand that when I talk about leveling with sand, we are not leveling sports fields. People will look at Connor Ward, my good friend, and say, he does it, but I can tell you that Connor runs his lawn like a golf green. He runs his lawn like a sports field. He does not run his lawn like 99% of you that are listening to this podcast. Connor's a freak in a good way, in a positive way. But he also mows his lawn every day. Promise you he does, at least every other day. Okay, so he treats his lawn like a golf green. For the rest of, that's why he puts the sand down every year. But for us, the rest of us, the first thing I want to point out is that sand leveling is a once, maybe twice, maybe three times thing, but usually twice, okay? You don't have to think that you have to, if you have issues in your lawn, that you have to correct them with one sand leveling, but you probably shouldn't have to correct them with more than two. If you're going to put layer in a good inch, and I wouldn't do really more than an inch in most places at one time because you don't want to bury the grass. So if your lawn is so bad, there's so many bumps, there's so many low spots that you feel the need to have to level it more than twice with sand, then I would recommend you don't even try to level it with sand, that you go back the other way and scrape it and regrade it from the, from the jump. Start completely over. There is a point where sand leveling can be used if you have minor bumps. And again, to me, this is not a hard and fast rule. Don't go telling people this was my hard and fast rule. But for the most part, logically speaking, if you're going to sweep a layer of sand over your lawn to help it to be level, flat, get rid of the bumps, okay, you can do maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch one time. And if you need to do it three quarters of an inch to an inch another time, and really, it's probably going to be more like a half inch in most places. If you have to do it more than twice, I would say you're going to be better off just going backwards, starting over, scrape it up, and regrade. Because you've got a bad problem. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you got dealt a bad hand with a bumpy, crappy lawn. And I don't mean the lawn itself. I mean the soil. Either it wasn't properly finished, graded in the beginning, which I see all of the time. I've seen it so much. I've mentioned this before in the podcast when I worked over by the South Side of Illinois, over by there, Frankfurt. Orland Park, Tinley Park, Mokina Moni over there. And I would see all these new construction lawns. They're putting these houses up so fast in the 90s. And there was no real finished grade done. I mean, it was a final grade, which was just not properly prepared, crusty clay. And, uh, you know, somebody had to get some some sod down so they could get their their, their permit of occupancy permit. And they just put that sod down over and tons of bumps and garbage. I've seen these lawns. I've walked on them. I've sprayed them. Sorry you got dealt a bad hand. If you can't sweep some sand in there a couple times and get that to fix, then you're going to have to fix what your builder didn't. That's just kind of how it works. Or just live with the bumps, which is what most people actually do. Especially if you have cool season lawn, you're mowing at three and a half, four inches. You can live with some bumps. You certainly can. So that's kind of what I would say. If you got to do it more than twice, it's probably that your lawn is so bad, your soil, your grade... Let me use the right term. Your grade is so bad that you just need to start over. All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing, when it comes to, uh, and, and that's what I mean. If So so back to that, if you're having to say that I got a sand level five, six, seven times, I wouldn't do that. I would start over. Now, if you get to the point, though, where you did have a cut, you did that sand leveling twice, and it feels good. It feels decent. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's good enough now. It feels much better, right? Much better than it was. And you have these areas where there is a little bit more sand than others. Well, those are areas you're going to want to amend, just like you would anything. That's where you can use, you know, humic acid, hose them down, paint them black, get some organics in there. Um, so you start using organic fertilizer to to help improve those areas. Get some carbon in there. It's not hard. I have, I'm looking out my window here. Uh, I need to do a video on this. I have some palms that are growing in pure sand. And that's because a lot of palms pr appreciate pure sand. By the way, I have a, t a challenge here that, most of you don't realize, I don't talk a lot about my palms, but I'm going to do some videos this this winter on them. But I actually have clay soil where I live here. I'm north of the Manatee River, and just the way the topography has moved over the years, we're actually sitting on clay. And every time I have anybody come here to do any kind of work, they're like, oh, gosh, you're one of these guys with all the clay. So you, I have a challenge in that I'm growing palms, which palms prefer sand for the most part, or loam. They're growing in clay. So I have this really bad challenge with palms, and I've succeeded. So anyway, I have a couple pots, though, that are isolated under my deck over here where I have these palms growing in pure sand, but the sand is black. It was pure white sand. I just got mason sand from the store when I planted them, but now the sand is black because I've been 
putting in organic materials, organic fertilizers, humic acid, lots of humic, lots of stuff from the next line. And now the sand is black because that, that black is an indication of organic material that's now in that sandy soil. So those are areas that a part of your sand leveling is you also have to realize, okay, I'm going to have to amend the soil in these areas. And I just like the liquids the best because a liquid is already the smallest particle that it's going to be. Spray it in there, let it mix in, and you'll see. You'll have nice black, I don't want to use the word dirt, black dirt, because people think of that like like this beautiful topsoil of full of organic material. No, it's the opposite of that, but you're turning it into something that has some CEC value to it that can hold water, that can hold nutrients, and that you're not going to have a challenge with over time. So it's all part of that. And then it goes back to why I always say don't use topsoil to level. Again, I'll just reiterate this. Topsoil can be full of all kinds of seeds, weed seeds. And people will say, well, you could just control those with weed control. But yeah, but what if you bring in something that can't be controlled with weed control, like a goosegrass or something like that? Then what are you going to do? So it's much better to use sand, which is clean, and then build the sand up with organic material, amend the sand, rather than using topsoil that's going to break down over time anyway, that you're going to have to keep putting in there, that could introduce weeds in there that you're going to have to use extra chemical on. So lots of different stuff there to look at, but I just wanted to kind of explore that a little more. Do not put in three, two, three, four inches of, of sand at one time on your lawn. Do it over time. Do it slowly. But if you think you're going to have to do it more than twice, I would recommend looking at some other options. Okay, next, let's go into some power raking questions here for St. Augustine grass. This one comes from uh, Israel, and Israel says, Hey, Alan, I have a question. Is it okay to power rake St. Augustine grass? I live in Orlando, and if it is okay, when is the best time of the season to do it? Good question, Israel. So I get this one a lot, and um, again, I'm going to refer back to my channel. I just did a video last week showing a lot of really good information on St. Augustine grass. I kind of gave it a, a title that was like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with my St. Augustine grass because I have a disease in there. But I talked a lot about about, about St. Augustine growth habits in the very beginning of it. And I kind of got, I got I, I feel like it was one of the videos where I've taught some of the best teaching that I've taught all year to kind of talk about the growth habit of St. Augustine grass and explain to you why it looks the way it does certain times of years. It's not always disease. Sometimes it's just the natural growth habit of the St. Augustine grass. So make sure you go to the Lawn Care Nut channel and check that out. You will see that video up there. It has some big fat grass blades with big brown spots on them. Watch that whole video. I think you'll learn something. Even if you don't have St. Augustine grass, I always say a lot of you guys are going to retire down here in Florida. And uh, we welcome you here. But please do not treat your St. Augustine grass like you treat your Kentucky bluegrass. And don't hate on it either. Man, you guys hate on that St. Aug so bad. But anyway, as far as dethatching goes. So to me... And I'll say this, and I'll get a bunch of people that'll say it's not rare, but to me, it's rare that St. Augustine grass needs to be dethatched. Because of the nature of its growth habit, it grows with stolons, and those stolons can creep through and break through anything. They can push through things. So it isn't like um, uh, Kentucky bluegrass that is a bunch-type grass. Now, it does have some rhizomes, I get it, but for the most part, a bunch-type grass or tall fescue that's a bunch-type grass, where it's just roots and, and it's roots and, and grass blades. And so if you do get a lot of thatch to settle around that, it doesn't necessarily have a way to break through it, and that can block then air, water, and nutrients from getting into the soil. It can also cause too much thatch, can also cause the grass roots to not penetrate into the soil. Rather, they will stay up in that thatch layer where all the water is, right? But with our grass, even if you have a thick thatch layer, our stolons are so thick, and if you have St. Augustine grass, go pull a stolon up, and look at how meaty those stolons are. Stolons are runners that creep across the top of the ground and they push down roots well every couple inches they put out a node and the node will do two things it will push down roots and the second thing it will do is push up grass blades they are thick and they are woody to a point those can push through thatch so that's the first thing so it's not going to choke the grass now too much thatch can happen if you get more than about an inch or an inch and a quarter of just completely matted dead material in your saint augustine then yes that can be a little bit too much now I would ask why that happened first before you go and dethatch. Now, again, St. Augustine is spongy in general, especially if it's older. My St. Augustine on the one side has been there since 2005, so it's fairly spongy, but there's no thatch there. What you're feeling under your feet when you feel like it's spongy is just a lot of stolons all interwoven together, but it isn't thatch. But if you do think your thatch is too deep, if you're digging in there and you're like, man, I got just this solid inch, inch and a half of just dead stuff, I would ask, why is that happening first? Are you uh, not mowing 
frequently enough. Uh, I looked at a University of Florida article on the uh, on the on thatch, and it said that you know lawns that are, get too much nitrogen and, and over watering can get a thatch buildup. Well, in Florida, you don't control your watering from like May until September. You get rain every day. <laughs> so people always think, well, I'm watering too much. No, no, you probably can't control it if you live in Florida. It's not your fault. So always look at those things the right way. And as far as how much nitrogen is, what is too much? I mean, is there too much in one app or is it too much all during the year? There's so many different ways to look at that. I typically recommend what is considered a low nitrogen program. I like to feed mine three quarter pound of nitrogen monthly. That's not a high nitrogen program, you know, especially when you look at some of the programs that are out there where people are putting down a pound and a half, you know, every application, but they're putting a pound and a half down at once. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. And it's uh, something we don't want to get into right now. But the idea being, don't blame yourself. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Now, however, what if you have an underpowered mower that's leaving clumps. Okay, that could be contributing to thatch. What if you're not mowing often enough and the grass is getting overgrown? That can happen. So make sure you correct the problem first. Don't blame yourself if it comes to overwatering or too much nitrogen, but make sure you get that mowing correct. Make sure you have a lawnmower that's powerful enough that it's not leaving clumps. And you'll know when you look down in your grass, you'll be able to see after you mow over if, if you can see the grass clumped up there or matted across. St. Augustine will tend to mat across and and it looks like well it looks like the grass is matted there because it's cut you know you, you let it go too long you need to correct that issue first now if you do need to dethatch though you don't actually dethatch dethatching won't work but you can do what's called verticutting or vertical mowing it's a similar looking machine it's got blades that are several inches apart and those blades kind of go down into the lawn and they will cut through but they will slice all the way down into the soil slightly now, the thing about that is you're going to cut some of your stolons, but it will also pull out enough of the thatch that it will relieve that thatch layer. Now, you're going to have to, after you do your vertical mow, you're going to have to rake all that up. And let me tell you, that is going to be the worst day of your life. If you've ever raked a lawn up north, that is not easy after after you dethatch. Well, let me just tell you, after vertical mowing a St. Augustine lawn, going out and trying to rake that, that will be the worst day of your life. It will be 10 times harder than anything you've ever done. Every stolen that is left will grab your rake and try to pull you down and your face will fall into the, you'll bust your face on the rake a bunch of times. I'm just telling you, it's not going to be easy and it's going to be the worst day of your life. Just trust me. Now, when you do the vertical mowing, you only want to go one direction. So not north and south and east and west, for example, because you will cut too many of your stolons and the stolons are the lifelines of your lawn. Imagine if you cut your arm off, your fingers are going to die. That is basically what's going to happen. So you do not want to cut off all the stolons, but even the vertical mowing going one way, north and south only, is going to damage your lawn. So you need to do it in the late, late spring, maybe even early summer, when the lawn is actively growing. And you're going to want to make sure that your irrigation is up to par because opening the grass up like that's going to dry it out. The sun is also going to be able to shine down in there when you start removing all that thatch, which will dry out the soil quicker. But just the, the cuts, the ripping of the stolons themselves is going to allow them to dry out. Now, they'll survive. The nodes that are rooted in will survive. They will regrow. You're going to want to make sure your fertilizing plan is solid. You want to, you know, keep that lawn moving. But that's what you can do. If you really do feel that your thatch is that bad and that thick, I would recommend if you are feeling that, that maybe you dig up a couple areas, take some pictures, take some samples to your local county extension service. Let them identify, is the thatch really the problem here? Or am I just looking at my spongy, thick St. Augustine grass that I just don't really know a lot about because it's so different. It's, its growth habit is so different. Its look, its feel, its appeal is so different from what I'm used to when I lived up over by Michigan or Ohio or New York or wherever I lived up north. Things are so different down here. Make sure that you're actually looking at a thatch problem and that you're not just looking at a thick stolen base, which is what we want. So I would make sure you look at that. One other thing I will say about thatch being a problem in St. Augustine, and this is not typically the way our St. Augustine grass grows, it can suck in enough water, even through thick thatch, that it shouldn't affect it too badly. So there you go. A couple little tidbits of information on dethatching St. Augustine. I think I have some more dethatching stuff coming up here in uh, some more segments. All right, next, got somebody wrote in about seeding zoysia grass. This is from Andrew K. Hi, Alan. I've been following you for about a year, and I'm finally able to have enough time to take over the care of my own lawn due to retiring from the U.S. Army. 
Andrew, thank you for your service, brother. Who raw? I am in coastal Georgia, and I'll be converting my lawn from centipede to zenith zoysia in the spring. I will be killing off the current front yard, 2,500 square feet, prep for seed bed, planting from seed. Backyard conversion, 2,500 square feet, will be easier as we are building up the yard and will be able to start with fresh dirt. I have an initial soil test and will be correcting the P and K deficiency over the fall. My question is, when is the best time to apply pre-emergent for next season, for next season's growing success, and what is a good choice? I didn't see any offerings of pre-emergent on the website. Have a great day. Okay, so... I uh, emailed Andrew and I said, buddy, I'm going to first try to talk you out of seeding. <laughs> the reason being is you don't have a big lawn there. You have 2,500 square feet in the back and 2,500 in the front. You have 5,000 square feet. One pallet of sod covers about 400 square feet. So you're going to need, what, like 13, 14 pallets if my math is right. And uh, if you're looking, I don't know what Zoysia costs where you are, but if you're looking at $300 a pallet, yeah, I get it. Four or five grand. You know, take some of that TDY money. <laughs> but just think about it. Just think about it if you can fit it into your budget into sodding or maybe sod one half of it or something. And uh, the reason I talk about or try to discourage you from seeding warm season turf, especially zoysia, is because you do have to do it in the spring and you're going to get overrun by weeds. So let me first go. So the one thing Andrew does have is he's correct. He does need to do his seeding in the springtime. The reason that you don't want to seed warm season turf in the fall is because of day length. It doesn't have anything to do with warmth. Even though he's at coastal Georgia, it's going to get too cold, and I think he knows that. It's going to get too cold anyway. But down here in South Florida, you have enough warmth. We'll stay in the 80s, um, mostly through through the winter and all that. We'll have plenty of warmth to grow grass from seed all during the winter. But what we don't have is the day length we don't have long enough days. So even though it's warm, it's really the sunlight that our, our grass needs. And warm season turf requires a lot more sunlight than any northern turf ever would. Because of the fact that we push, especially with, with zoysia, not only roots, not only top growth, but we have to push stolons and rhizomes. That's a lot of energy needed. And so you need a lot of sunlight, which is another reason why we tell you to grow zoysia and Bermuda, which are those two that grow with both stolons and rhizomes, we tell you to grow those in full sun. And when I mean full sun, I mean full sun, not, well, you know, I got three hours a day of shade. Well, that's not full sun, bro. Well, you know, I got uh, I got two and a half hours of dappled sun through the day. That's not full sun, bro. Well, you know, uh, in the morning it's shaded, but it's sunny in the afternoon. That's not full sun, bro. You got to have full sun. And I'm not saying that to Andrew. I just felt like going down that little rabbit trail. But warm season turf needs full sun. There is no good grass for shade that is warm season turf. Now, I know as soon as I say that, some people are going to show me something. Trust me, I see grass that grows in the shade, okay, up here. It's usually some sort of St. Augustine, like a palmetto or whatever. But when you get up close to it, it is extremely thin. From far back, it looks, oh, it doesn't look too bad. And then you get up underneath there, and it's not. It's very, 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 very thin. You just don't see it from the road where you notice it. Anyway, back to it. Don't want to go down that rabbit trail too hard. But the same thing, so it, it, just if I'm going to tell you that you need full sun to grow this, if you're trying to grow it over winter where you're only getting 10 hours of daylight, whereas in the summer you get 13 hours of daylight, you could consider yourself having your lawn three hours shaded a day. That's basically what I'm telling you. That's why you can't grow these seeds. You should not attempt to grow these seeds in the winter. And I know this not only from the logic that I'm explaining to you, but from experience where I tried to grow Bermuda in St. Petersburg, Florida, starting in October a couple, two, three years ago, and the struggles I went through. <laughs> anyway, all right, back to it. Why I don't recommend seed. Well, let's go back to his question first. Andrew asked about pre-emergence. Now, Andrew, as far as I know, there are no pre-emergence that you're going to be able to use if you are going to use or grow uh, zoysia in the spring. Now, you could use one now in the fall. You certainly could. You could use dithiopyr, or you could use prodiamine. You could put that down. I wouldn't put down more than four pounds a thousand. Today, I'm talking to you on September 11th. Hoorah, shout out to all of our heroes who helped us on this day. Man, I forgot what day it was. Isn't that terrible? Wow, September 11th. Um, but anyway, if you are seeding on this day, and... Uh, you're not going to want to probably stretch it much past March because you're going to probably want to seed sometime in May. And I would want a little buffer zone in there. You got to have a buffer zone. 
So if you put down four pounds per thousand now, it's September, October, November, December, January, February, man, maybe you could do five pounds per thousand now of perdiamine or dithiapyr. You could do that. That'll help you. For sure, that'll help you. But then again, if you're on bare ground, you could just glyphosate it all out too, you know, come February, March. So kind of a give or take there. But there is no pre-emergent that you would be able to use when you actually seed your zoysia. And because of that, you're going to have to do all this watering to get the zoysia in. And that watering is going to encourage all kinds of weeds to grow right up alongside of it. And I can promise you the weeds will run faster and harder than your zoysia will. Now, some people will say, Alan, what about tenacity or mesotrione? Mesotrione is a pre-emergent you can use with seeding. So let's go to that first. And it is, he's right. People, anybody that would say that, say, you're right. It's true. You could use mesotrione with seeding. But let me just read you from the label of mesotrione about new seedings. New seeding and new lawn establishment. This is right off the label. Apply tenacity. And again, mesotrione. We have the generic on our website if you want it. Same thing. Apply mesotrione at 5 to 8 fluid ounces per acre and at least 30 gallons of water per acre prior to seeding or post-seeding of tolerant turf grass species listed on this label, except fine fescue. So right there, what does it say? Tolerant turf grassed grasses listed on this label. Okay, so I'm going to go up to the top and see the turf grass species listed on this label. Tenacity has been tested on these species and found to be safe under trial conditions. Species, Kentucky bluegrass, centipede grass, buffalo grass, tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, fine fescue, St. Augustine grass grown for sod. That's it. I don't see zoysia listed. So right there, it's not on the label. You can't use it. Now, will the tenacity or will the mesotrion kill the zoysia? I don't know. All I know is I'm going to follow the label because that's how I roll. And the label says that you could use it as a pre-emergent at the time of seeding for labeled turf grasses, and I don't see zoysia listed here. So therefore, the answer is no. There is no pre-emergent that I know of that you can use with zoysia seed. So therefore, you're going to have to hope for the best with the weeds. Now, the other thing to realize is that zoysia is going to be slow to establish. And when I say that, uh, I mean that with all warm season grasses, zoysia or Bermuda. Those are the main ones that people are going to try to seed. Zoysia is a little slower than Bermuda in my, in my experience. Now, it'll germinate in, in just a few days, 14 days or so, maybe 10 days, depending. But then from there, you got to realize that it's going to take a good, I would tell you, three or four months at best for it to establish a decent turf stand. Decent, where you're still going to have a lot of thin areas throughout, where it's still going to look mostly flat because it's putting all of its energy into rhizomes and stolons and not much into top growth. And so during that time, it's going to be weak and you're not really going to be able to spray a lot of post-emergent weed controls either because those post-emergents will stymie or stunt the zoysia because it's so young and because it's so new and because it's not established very well. So you're really not going to be able to use a lot of post-emergents either. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have all of these weeds growing up right alongside of it and you're going to have to use a lot of chem because the thing that those weeds are going to do is drop more and more seed all during that time. So you're going to have to use a lot of chem later in the year. Say if you seeded your zoys in June, you could probably start spraying for weeds sometime in later August or early September. You also have to realize there's going to be 85 degree temperature restrictions in there that you got to worry about all these things, right? So maybe by September, you're able to start spraying for weeds, but how many weeds will have grown alongside of your zoysia? It's just, it's, I'm just telling you, it's a prospect that is not easy. Now, he does have small lawn areas well you got 5,000 total but two small areas of 2,500 each that's why I recommend maybe sod one one area and then seed the other because it is actually easier to handle a smaller area just easier to keep it watered even if you have in-ground sprinkler systems it's easier to manage a small area at a time so that might be something that would work a little easier maybe you could hand pick a lot of the weeds something like that but I'm just telling you, it's going to be a challenge. Now, does that mean that I'm telling you that you can't do it people always say Alan says not to do it well I recommend against it for these reasons. It's the same reason why, you know, when I was growing up, my mom told me, you should not, you know, put your aspirations on being a, a pro baseball player because you're short and you can't run fast. <laughs> she was just being honest with me. Could I have been a pro baseball player? Maybe. I mean, I could hit the ball pretty well. I couldn't get to first base, so I, can't, I hit the ball. <laughs> I hit a line drive to center field and get thrown right at first base. <laughs> my little legs, you know. <laughs> well, I could hit the ball good. Oh. You know, I had a good curveball. I don't know. There, It's possible, but there's a certain, like, you know from experience, like, as a, as a human, you know this is probably not the best idea for you, right? 
That's what it is. It's just me giving you good advice. Does it mean that you could succeed with Zoysia Seed? Of course you could. Just trying to give you some advice. Now, if you want the challenge, I get it. It's not the worst challenge to go for in the world. It's, tr- it's totally not. It's a fun challenge, actually. I'm just trying to give you good advice because the majority of people, they're really just looking to get a quality lawn quick and sodding is what you want to do. Now, if your budget doesn't allow for that, then obviously, of course, go for that seed. And I'm sorry, my brother, there just is no pre-emergent that can be used at the time of seeding. All right, let's go to our next one. This is kind of similar. And uh, this one came in from a lot of different people. So we will throw this one out there. And the question is, how do I control thatch in zoysia? So this would be when you have a mature zoysia lawn and uh, they are prone to thatch buildup big time, especially if you mow them taller. By the way, this weekend, I'm going to put out my video showing my rehab of my church zoysia lawn. I finally got it to a point where it is beautiful now, but it's only turned the corner in the last like month. Man, it was hard. It was just so many things. And it wasn't hard for a lot of reasons other than sometimes, you know, like we had our irrigation system went down and I didn't know about it for an entire week and the whole thing turned brown. I mean, (laughs) we had had drought conditions in the spring. Um, Just, you know, a myriad of different things happened. It it started out super compacted anyway because of thousands of people walking on it over Christmas when we have our Christmas, uh, they do this giant, Uh, Our church does this giant um, Bethlehem scene. It's really awesome, though. I mean, complete with actors and everything. People, um, thousands of people walk on this. Thousands, thousands of people walk on this, and they just trample it for the last, like, 10 years, ever since the church has been there. And so here I am trying to revive this lawn (laughs) from that. So it wasn't easy, but it's finally at that point. So I'm going to talk to you about what I've learned doing that challenge and some of the things I love about Zoysia. But one of the things is, that I'm going to talk about is the mowing height on zoysia. And I'm going to surprise you with where I go with that. But for sure, a lot of folks will mow zoysia tall. And I kind of understand that. It just happens. Again, we'll go into that in the video this weekend on the Lawn Care Nut channel where I talk about those challenges I ran through. But if you do mow your zoysia tall, it will build up a thatch layer. And so when that happens, you do need to dethatch it. Because with zoysia, unlike St. Augustine, with zoysia, things are a little thinner, things are a little finer, a little smoother. And you can have a real bad spongy issue with it to where it will affect the rooting. And uh, it'll it'll cause your zoysia literally to brown out if the thatch gets too bad. So you do have to dethatch it. But here's the good news with zoysia. You don't need to rent a dethatching machine or any of that. You just need to scalp it in the spring. So zoysia and Bermuda are grass types that you should scalp every spring. It's just part of what you should do as maintenance of those two grass types. The answer is no, you don't scalp St. Augustine grass in the spring or centipede, but you can and you should scalp zoysia and you can and you should scalp um, Bermuda every single spring. And the essence of scalping will rip out all the thatch. So there is no need to rent a separate dethatcher. Just get out whatever your oldest mower is. And let me tell you, I did it on uh, my church project there. I'll have to roll out the Bermuda project later. It's still struggling a little bit. I'm still messing with some doveweed. Uh, my ultimate enemy out there on that. But uh, but yeah, scalp it. So that's how you do it. Every spring, just plan to scalp your zoysia and that will rip out all of the thatch at the same time as you scalp it down and encourage it to start growing again and get more warmth into the roots and all that. And you will be all good. All right, let's throw on a little music and then we're going to get into our recordings for the week. Here we go. Imagine living without it, without it So let's go Everything's worth fighting 
was a good one like that get you moving get you happy keep that positivity flowing all right let's go now to our recordings i think i need to turn this back up a little bit there we go all right let's go now to our recordings and we're going to go first to aaron in st louis hey alan this is uh, aaron from st louis missouri i have a tur- turf type tall fescue so the purpose of the call, I've struggled just like everybody else in the Midwest or pretty much all over the country with these temperatures. But what I'm driving out with this call is the best way I've noticed to, to get a debate going on your site or the page or anywhere is to bring up dethatching. And I notice you, you've never really touched on it, or if you have, it's very brief. But I, I'm just hoping you could uh, shed some light for all of us, all us nuts, because it seems to go hand in hand with a right around the aeration and overseeding period. I noticed you, you just, you've never really uh, talked about it. So I'm hoping you can touch on it because um, it would do us all some good. And especially on the site when it's brought up, uh, there's definitely some misinformation, uh, pro, con, how often to do it. Some people say you should never do it. So I think we'd all appreciate it if you would touch on dethatching when it's necessary, if it's ever necessary, and uh, what the window is that you think we should do it. I uh, appreciate everything you do, Alan. Uh, talk to you soon. Hope to hear a uh, reply. Take it easy. All right, Aaron, good question. All right, so let's talk about dethatching. We've already talked about it in this podcast a little bit, but now we're going to talk about it in relation to cool season lawns. So there is uh, the first thing is there's kind of this rite of passage where people love to go out and buy the Greenworks dethatcher or there's some other company that makes a dethatcher or rent one. And then you put up your picture of all of the stuff that you pulled up out of the lawn. It's like this rite of passage. Look at me. Ho, ho. It's like uh, Tom Hanks in Castaway. I have made fire. I have made big piles of dead thatch in my lawn. I am such a man. Right? It's like this thing. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. I do. Because dethatching will kick your tail. It will kick your butt, bruh. But I do think that a good majority of that is unneeded. So let's talk about thatch first. And again, let's talk about it in relationship to healthy layers of thatch and why it's there in a cool season lawn. So for cool season grass, up to one half inch of thatch is good. If you're a little higher, that's fine. But up to a half inch of grass and the reason or dead material. And that's what thatch is. It's a layer of dead organic decaying material that sits right at the soil line. Now, I don't want you to think that the thatch that's there is always the same thatch that's there. No, it's continually breaking down and more is being added in as the grass cycles through. So it's not like, oh, I have a half inch of thatch layer there now and three years from now, well, that's the same thatch. No, it's organic material and organic materials break down. So I want you to think of your thatch layer as a living thing, kind of, or a constantly changing thing. All right. That's the first thing to look at it like there's good and bad about it. The good about having a thatch layer at one half inch or somewhere right around that is it helps to retain moisture, especially on those hot days. The sun can't get directly to the soil and suck the moisture out, which also shades the roots. There's only so much heat that we've talked about and grass and lawns can get too much heat 
but it's also the roots. If the roots can stay cool, then the lawn can survive those big heat waves, and thatch helps to do that. It also helps with erosion. You know, if you get big, large downpours and you don't have any thatch there, you could have areas of your lawn that will erode or wash out easier. So that's what thatch is for. But obviously, too much of it can have that opposite effect. It can block water, and uh, it can block nutrients. And as we mentioned before, it can also cause the grass roots then, if they're not getting any moisture down deep and nutrients down deep, the grass roots will literally turn and grow up towards that thatch where all that water is. So there's good and bad about that. But it doesn't mean that you have to remove all of it all the time. So I'll just tell you that in all of the years that I worked for True Green, I stepped on thousands of lawns. And I know people go, really? Yeah, man, I worked there for 15 years, bruh. I stepped on thousands of lawns, worked on many of those, but for sure stepped on them, running service calls, running estimates, running tree and shrub apps. We would look at lawns. You know, I'd run tree and shrub apps, uh, tree and shrub estimates in the summer. I'd run 40 to 50 of those a day, but we also looked at the lawn at the same time, went through and, and made notes about that. So, I mean, do the math on that. You know, when I was in operations, ran service calls all day, every day, ran on routes with guys all the time. When I was in sales, I did estimates on lawns. 30 to 50 of those a day. So I've seen a lot of lawns, a lot of cool season lawns, probably more, well, than anybody on YouTube for the most part, that's a DIYer. And I can tell you that in those areas, I probably saw maybe, and I'm being very generous here, I, I bet you less than 3% of those actually needed to be dethatched. And the ones that did need to be dethatched were in those areas that I mentioned before, where Orland Park, Tinley Park, in those areas where someone had an irrigation system installed and they had the lawn sodded and somebody had the irrigation system on to run 10 minutes per zone every other day. And so they created the thatch problem with poor irrigation from an irrigation system. But I can tell you of the lawns in Chicago, the old school lawns, probably zero, literally zero. I'm, I'm just telling you, and, and you, any of you could test me on this right now. You can go to any old school lawns in Chicago. I'm talking like the K Streets up over by there, Colmar, killed there. I'm talking about those. Go over there. Go look at all those K Streets up over by there. And you go look at those lawns, how beautiful they are, those little postage stamps. And you tell me if you find thatch problems. You won't find it. You're not going to find it. Go to Evergreen Park. Go to Marionette Park. Go to Beverly. You ain't going to find no thatch problems, okay? So it's... it. When I look at and when I know that and I see so many people doing this dethatching, I think it's a thing. And I do know that there were people in Northwest Indiana when I lived there, there were people in our neighborhood that would dethatch every single spring. For some reason, it was something their dad had taught them that, hey, this is what we do to the lawn. It's a chore. It's a I feel good about it. It's kind of like the guy that changes his oil every 3,000, even though now we have synthetic oil that you can go seven, eight, ten thousand, but he still changes his oil every 3,000 because that's what his dad taught him, okay? You do not need to dethatch unless you have a visible problem where your thatch layer is over a half inch. I'm just going to tell you. Now, what some people, so that's that's that. Now, some people will say that, and by the way, you can verify that, you can pull a plug out of the lawn and you can see, and don't pull just one, pull a myriad of plugs. I mean, maybe you only have a thatch problem in one corner and you can just do it by hand. That's the other thing. You know, every spring I would do hand raking in my lawn. If you look at my videos from Crown Point, I did hand raking in my lawn every spring. There's just some areas that need to be raked out because they get more winter damage than others. And that rips out some thatch too, but that's not a full dethatching. It's just some raking. It's just creating airflow. It's just getting some sunlight down in there. Because sunlight will break down that dead grass. Sunlight, heat, and then the microbes come up and do it. Again, because your thatch layer is an ever-evolving, ever-moving, living kind of a thing. So that's that's what I want you to get there. Now, people will talk about aeration being, or uh, they will talk about dethatching being something that helps with seed-to-soil contact during aeration. I could see that, for sure. I definitely could see that. But I will tell you, at, at that point, if you're going to be seeding in the fall, and I, I don't know if I just said that right. Let's, let me say that again in case I said it wrong because I'm thinking about what I said as I said it. People will say that dethatching helps with seed-to-soil contact during seeding time. That's what they will say. So that is true. That can happen. If you're going to rip 100% of the thatch out, then, of course, by, by logic, you're going to get better seed-to-soil contact. However, I would say, though, that you're also doing yourself a disservice at that time because, again, for the reasons I mentioned in the beginning, that you do need some thatch there. So then I would say, 
if you want to improve your seed to soil contact, first thing I would say is, do you need to seed? Just look at your lawn. Do you actually need to seed? Because that's the other thing. People say, oh, I seed my lawn every year. Well, they just do it because they think they have to. But you don't have to seed your lawn every year. If your lawn is thick, why would you seed? Right? I don't, I have thick hair on top of my head. I don't go to the, to the, 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 the hair plug guy and get hair plugs. I don't need them. My hair's already thick. Right? It's the same thing. Why would you put seed in a lawn that's already thick? But again, if you do believe your lawn is overall thin, well, then I would just go with aeration. Aeration is going to be easier because you don't have to rake up all that crap you're pulling out of there. Just do a double, triple, quadruple pass aeration to create a nice seed bed for yourself. That's what I've said in the past. Poke more holes. By the way, when you do the aeration, it also does poke holes through the thatch layer. So that's what I would do. If, if it's something to improve seed to soil contact, I believe aeration is better for that. The other thing aeration does, obviously, is it's going to open up the lawn. So when you're throwing down all of that fertilizer that we also throw down with it, or if we're using any of our starter furs or any of that stuff, you get that biochar, get that humic acid, whatever. It gets it in those holes, gets it right down into the fat, into the uh, soil a lot quicker because it's you open things up by two tree inches there. So you're getting things down into the soil, whereas with dethatching, you're not doing that. So that's kind of some of the different thinking I would put to it. Again, I don't have a problem. If you want to dethatch your lawn every year, Go ahead. Just realize when you do dethatch, you're also hurting the good grass. You are also ripping out good grass. So, again, if it feels good for you, I really do. I'm just going to be honest with you on on this one and uh, and say, Aaron, that I really do believe that most people that are dethatching are doing it for a feel good. You, I, I, I totally know people could argue with me on that. But I just really think people are doing it for a feel good because they feel like it's a thing, it's a chore. But I don't, I don't necessarily see it being something super duper helpful in every single case all right that was a good one let's go on to our next one let's go to nick in long island new york hey alan how you doing this is nick from long island new york i'm calling regarding a question for cool season grass with a bent grass problem so i currently have a lawn that is primar- uh, primarily perennial rye with turf that's all fescue and kentucky bluegrass mixed in i battled fungus all year tried the bulletproof strategy with mixed results and have now decided to overseed. Uh, as I got to that point, I realized that there was a big issue that I've had with due to the help, uh, with actually with the help of the forum, the official lawn care not page, I've discovered is bent grass. I was recommended from all of the users to go with some sort of tenacity approach, but I was also going to overseed and I've picked up some seed from you as well as uh, some starter fruit. My question is, can I treat with tenacity now and then in two weeks apply another round of tenacity while I overseed a new starter for it? Or should I hold off on the overseeding and uh, starter for it until the springtime after I've done several rounds of tenacity treatment? I just don't know how much of a problem the bent grass will pose as I try to overseed. I don't know if it's something I could treat simultaneously while overseeding or if it's something that I should take care of now and then go back uh, to revisit the overseeding in the spring. Thank you so much for your help. Appreciate it. Take care. Good call, Nick. Good call. So I like that you're thinking through the strategy. I haven't said that enough this year. All of these questions are good because you guys are really thinking through the strategy. So uh, awesome on that. So good one. Let me answer your question first. On the uh, mesotrione tenacity, you can actually spray mesotrione or tenacity all the way up until the grass seed germinates. So you can uh, spray it two weeks before you seed. You can spray it one week before you seed, one day before you seed, one day, the same day you seed, the day after you seed. However, once the grass germinates, it will cause damage. So some of you, I mean, some of you guys, I love (laughs) one of those things. People put up pictures. I saw grass germinate after four days. Well, I got it after three. I got it after two. (laughs) It's like contest. How fast does my grass germinate? (laughs) Um, Premature germination. Oh, boy. We should make a T-shirt. I suffer from premature germination. (laughs) Oh, man. Keep it clean, Hayne. Um, So you don't want to do that. So I would recommend that you don't put tenacity down. Just put it down on the day of seed and make that the end point just so it's easy for you. So that'll answer that question. And, yes, tenacity is used to kill bent grass. But what is bent grass? Let's talk about it. Creeping bent grass is mostly what you guys are going to find in your lawns. And uh, the genus, species, whatever is Agrostis stolonifera. I love that. Agrostis stolonifera. I used to date a girl named stolonifera. 
It is mainly found on purpose on golf courses, and it's cut very short in the greens and tee boxes. So it is brought in on purpose, and I found that it happens a lot. We used to see this over by Crete, Illinois, over there on the south side of Chicago, and um, there's golf courses there, and people who lived on those golf courses, they would have bent grass all over their lawns because a couple of reasons why the Stolens would just come across on equipment or maybe they would drive their golf carts on and sneak onto the course and not want to pay the greens fee. And then they come back and they got it on their golf clubs, on their shoes, and they bring a couple two tree Stolens and that's all it really takes. And uh, it is a Stolenifera, Stoleniferous grass and it will take hold. Or I think sometimes people also would take the sanding, the divot fixes, the sand divot fix off the cart, take that home to try to fix bare spots in their lawn and not know it, they'd be bringing creeping bent grass into their lawn. So that's where I see it a lot is around golf courses that have it as greens, fairways, tee boxes. So not saying that's what you got going on there, Nick, but that's just something interesting that I used to notice when I worked for True Green over butter. So here's the deal. With the tenacity, yes, you can use that. You should start using that. And uh, personally, though, I would wonder, you know, creeping bent grass comes up pretty easily. So if it's only in a couple spots, I personally would just scrape it out. And uh, then I would seed those areas and maybe use a little uh, Greenview seed starter mulch or something a little sticky in those areas. And uh, use your tenacity with it, though, because... I just think that's a little better than trying to kill off the bent grass. Now, you could do it either way, though. You could spray it now, start to kill it all during. But remember, once the your new seed germinates, you don't want to spray it anymore. So that's why it may be easier just to scrape the stuff out if it's only in a few areas and then start fresh with seed. Now, it'll come back. Scraping it out, there's still going to be some stolens of it left. It's just how it's going to work. But that'll put you ahead of the eight ball. So then that way, next year, you can get on top of it with that tenacity earlier in the spring because you knew where it was. You can watch it and um, stay on top of it. And you could eliminate it with tenacity, but depending how bad the problem is, it may take a couple, two, three years to do that. And if your neighbors have it, it's going to keep coming back because, again, it only takes a small little piece of it to vegetatively transfer into your lawn. So hopefully that answers your question there, Nick. It's, uh, it's a battle that you, you can win. It's not one of the easiest ones we see, but it's one that you can win. All right, next let's go to Becky. We've got another Zoysia question. All right, this is an interesting one, though, because it's up in Connecticut. Let's hear from Becky. Hi, Alan. My name is Becky. I am calling from Wyndham, Connecticut. I am calling because I have a mixture of grass in one particular area is zoysia and um, not a very typical grass for cool season. And I'm just really wondering how to best take care of it. I definitely have some weeds that are encroaching there and I know I'm not supposed to use tenacity. So I'm um, just wondering if you could give some tips for people that do have zoysia in the cool season area and how to help it flourish. Thank you. Okay, Becky, this is a great question, and I've gotten this one actually this year a couple of times, so I'm glad we're addressing this. And uh, this is somebody that's got a lawn that is a mix of cool season like fescue or bluegrass, but mostly it's going to be fescue mixed with zoysia. And sometimes they're mixed together and growing together, and sometimes they're in different parts of the lawn. And I think that's pretty interesting. It's actually kind of a fun challenge, to be honest with you. Um so what about the zoysia? The thing I've always noticed about zoysia is that it usually repels weeds, broadleaf weeds, especially up north where your broadleaf weeds are not as aggressive. And I know those of you who are up north like, ow, our broadleaf weeds are aggressive. But they're not, you know, compared to down here where weeds are adapted to grow 11 or 12 months a year. So usually the zoysia can uh, choke those out. But that's pretty interesting. So here's the deal. What you'll have in an area like that is you'll have the zoysia is going to be green Probably in Connecticut, it probably is green from like June, July, August, and then it probably goes out dormant in uh, September. But then in the spring, that's when your fescue is going to be green in the spring, and it may struggle a little bit in the summer from heat, but also because the zoysia is going to take everything from it, all the goodness, all the things that you want to to be feeding that that fescue with. You know, even though it's struggling from heat, the zoysia is going to take it. So the, the fescue may go dormant, but then in the fall, the fescue will come back on. So it's kind of this interesting cycle that you have. And so you have to decide, like, how, how am I going to do this? How am I going to take care of it? So the first thing I would say is you can definitely use the prodiamine or the dithiapyr strategy the same. So spring, uh, spring dithiapyr, spring prodiamine, just like you normally would. Soil temperatures cross 55, bam, get down your prodiamine. Soil temperatures cross 65 heading to 70 in the spring, bam, get down your prodiamine. 
and then in the fall, as soil temperatures are falling to 70, bam, get down your prodiamine. That would be the same, or your dithiopyr. That'd pretty much be the same. Now you got to look at what can I use for a post-emergent weed control, and the one that works that, that will be fine on zoysia is the Speed Zone Red Label. Now you got to watch that one a little bit in the summer. I believe there's a heat restriction on it, but that is one I looked up that will work pretty much the reason why is because zoysia can handle 2,4-D. It can also handle quinclorac, which you can use to knock out any crabgrass that comes in. So I would look for those two different active ingredients there. Any, any of your mixes that you're going to find that have 2,4-D and quinclorac in them, those are going to be fine for both of those grass types. And speed zone would be more of an upper echelon, harder core, big pusher to knock those weeds out. Even though it does have that 85 degree temperature restriction on it, you could spray in the evenings in Connecticut in the summer and you would just want to spot spray any weeds that are in that zoysia and you're probably going to be just fine. Now, as far as feeding it goes, you know, I always talk about the growth curves and how cool season grass, we're going to hit it hard in spring and hard in the fall. We're going to kind of go lighter in in the summer. Whereas warm season turf, I talk about we're going to go hard in in the summer. And with zoysia, and I'm going to again reveal this in my video coming up, this weekend, zoysia loves to be pushed. Zoysia is the power lifter and it will take all of the protein and all of the carbs that you can give it and it will suck them up and it will lift hard weights and it will run back to you wanting more. So you can push your zoysia as hard as you want in the summer and in Connecticut, you're probably going to need to do that because it's not. it doesn't like being dormant in the winter, but it's going to do that where you live. So you got to give it all the energy that you can during the summer. That's also, though, going to help it to thick that up to choke out those weeds. Now, as far as what to do about mowing height, I would go ahead and just try to find that happy medium. So the fescue would be better at four inches. The zoysia, believe it or not, is going to be better around three. So I would just mow them all at three. Just let the fescue figure it out because the fescue is going to be fine in the spring and fall at three anyway. And the zoysia is going to love it at three. And everything is going to be all good. So... That's kind of how I would approach those two things mixed together. I hope that that helps you out. You probably won't need to aerate that lawn. I'm thinking the zoysia rhizomes and everything are going to push through enough to keep everything aired out for you and keep the soil decent, you know, because those rhizomes are so strong. But hopefully that gives you a little bit of good information that you needed there, Becky. All right. Next, let's go to Jeff in Sherville, Indiana. I used to live right by there. The region. Hello, my name is uh, Jeff up in Cherville, Indiana. My question is, uh, my lawn is two years old. Um, I seeded the backyard side of the front yard, uh, heavy clay with a layer of topsail above the clay from the landscaper prior to laying down the sod seed. Last year, which was my first summer, I started with just some aroganite from April to July, and I noticed uh, I wasn't seeing good results. Uh, that's when I went with a uh, local company around here, uh, to do my fertilization um, due to the bad soil composition. I have a few bare spots in the backyard that didn't take the seed and they claimed that their fertilizer was superior to what I could buy over the shelf and that it would help. They also did a soil enrichment uh, twice last year. Um, I did a soil sample earlier this year and I started with your bio stim pack. Uh, I also still have the company coming out doing six fertilization applications and two soil enrichments this year. Uh, which they call soil life product. Uh, my question is, going forward next year, I'd like to get rid of this service uh, as I feel they are too expensive and I'd like to just do it myself. Besides using the BioStim uh, four gallon, or the four pack, um, what would be my regular fertilizer uh, maintenance uh, for my lawn? Uh, would it be a Scott's four-step fertilizer process or would I be better off doing something like the XG and DIY uh, fertilizer that was recommended on uh, the soil sample that uh, you did? Look forward to hearing the answer. Thank you. All right. This can be a good one to unpack, Jeff. And the good news with that is, is I had that same soil because I lived in Crown Point right on the border of St. John, only probably five, six miles from you at the most, maybe even closer, depending on what part of Cherville you're in. And I dealt with that. I didn't have the topsoil in my lawn. I had only the clay because I'm actually against bringing in topsoil. I just, I've gone over that before. I just don't think it does anything but add problems. I think you should love the soil that you have. And I think you should improve the soil that you have. And it's not that difficult. 
And let me talk about that just a little bit. So my lawn in Northwest Indiana, I seeded it on the bare clay. I had a finished grade put on there. Guy came in with a bobcat and a box blade and uh, took out all the rocks, put a nice finished grade on, and then I seeded it, covered it with pot peat moss, and watered the heck out of it. You can ask Jake the Lawn Kid. They made fun of me for weeks and weeks and weeks while I tried to get that to come in, but it finally did. Here's the thing about that soil. That soil was that same clay that you have, but within a couple, two, three years, and that's the case here. It takes a couple years. It was beautiful to the point where I never had to aerate it. I think I aerated it once because I took the machine. I had the machine on the back of the uh, my pickup uh, from True Green, and I was going by my house. I'm like, yeah, I'll go aerate, but I didn't really have to. I just did it, but other than that, I never aerated in all the years that I lived there, and the reason I didn't have to is because I had packed so much organic material or carbon but organic material into that soil and I did it with only two fertilizers that I had at the time Malorganite and Ringer Lawn Restore and I don't know what Ringer's at these days I know they changed the formulation but I know that Malorganite is still the same and I still highly recommend it uh, I'm actually doing a promotion with Malorganite right now if you go to the Malorganite blog you'll see there's a promotion where you can actually win some lawn coaching from me go over there and check that out but Malorganite works great if you can find it it's just organic material it's 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 uh, it's the microbes that have consumed waste <laughs> from the waste stream, and those microbes are cooked and baked and then prilled, and you put those in your lawn, and it smells like success, but that is, that's organic material, man. It's stuff that's going to break down, and it's going to improve your soil, and that's all you need. Now, obviously, we like to use other things because it does only have nitrogen and phosphorus in it. You need to get some K in there, and then over the years, I've learned that there's a lot of other great ways to get organic and material and carbon into your lawn and we'll talk about those but I do want to talk about how you had a company that was doing like the synthetic stuff and now you have this company that's doing like soil life improvements and all that kind of interesting it's just marketing stuff but I respect it and I don't know what that company is so I don't want to try to disparage them because I don't know exactly what they're putting down but I will say this from my experiences with True Green with True Green and, I, and I'm remembering pretty close here I'm sure all of our fertilizers were just in with a little bit of K now, we had starter ferts like a 202010 that had NP and K in them, but none of them had any micronutrients in them that I remember for sure. But the most things that we put down was like a 2404, maybe an 1801 or an 1802. That was really all we ever put down. There was no humic acid, no sea kelp, none of that. We couldn't afford that stuff, right? So it was just basic synthetic fertilizer. Now, I want to say I have no problem with synthetic fertilizer. I use it in my lawn. And you can find plenty of videos where I do, but I don't use it exclusively and only. I use it as a tool, just like I use all of these things as a tool. I like to put all kinds of stuff in my lawn. I like to treat it with a lot of different things, liquids, uh, granulars, synthetics, organics, naturals, whatever terms you want to use, biochar, humic acid, sea kelp. I like putting all that stuff in, right? All of the things. Because number one, it's fun. But number two, I've learned and seen over time that it actually works to have that nice mix of things. Again, the key is carbon, soil carbon. But what I would see with True Green lawns, because we didn't use any of that funky fresh stuff because it was only synthetic, is when we would get to lawns that hadn't been treated, they would look great for like two or three years. Man, they would look good because they had no fertilizer put on them, right? They just had that nasty clay soil. And it's not nasty. It's just not, doesn't have anything in it. There's really no redeeming value in it. And our synthetic ferch would do fine because the lawns would eat them up. But over time, the soil would not be improved. And the lawns wouldn't wouldn't really respond to just that same synthetic fur. This is why I started using, when I would get service calls from people, they'd be like, man, my lawn doesn't look good. I'd bomb it with starter fur. Heavy. That's where I got the idea of hammering the nitrogen. Like, hey, starter fur fixes everything because I know the stuff's not working anymore that we're normally doing. And I got I to gotta make you feel good here. So I'm going to put down starter fur and I'm going to put it down hard put down a pound of nitrogen, a pound of phosphorus, you know, and when you got a 20, 20, 10, it's only four pounds per thousand. You're hammering, you know, maybe five pounds per thousand. I mean, you hammer that in there, you're going to get a response, right? And then every once in a while, we would have something called neutraline that did have iron. Put that down. Okay, now we got some green response. But for the most part, these, these, uh, these synthetic ferts, they wouldn't work for long. So, it's just, it's just the way it works. But the thing is, most of True Green's customers, they're not necessarily caring about having the deepest, darkest, double dark, dominant blue green lawn on the block. They care about not having weeds. And True Green caters to that. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's True Green's thing. They'll get rid of your weeds. They really will. Unless it's like Creeping Charlie or something that requires them to go outside of their norm, then they won't. But if you just want your dandelion and your clover killed, eh, they can do that for you. They can put down your prodiamine, keep the crabgrass out, good at that stuff. 
That's what they do. Now, this new company that you're working with, they're probably putting down some funky fresh stuff. They might be putting down some microbes in the soil and stuff, and I don't want to get into all that stuff. But, you know, they might be doing some of that, and I'm sure it's better. But, yeah, you're going to pay for that, and it's expensive. But for them to tell you that what they have is better than what you can get in the store, probably true, but, you know, we have an online store, an online garden center, I call it. I always find that funny. People will say, Alan, you promote too many products. I'm like, well, let me ask you. If I owned a brick-and-mortar garden store in Springfield, Illinois, and I did videos about the stuff that I carried in my brick-and-mortar store, would you have a problem with it? Would you think I was promoting too? Well, no, no, man. You're just talking about what's in your store. <laughs> well, that's all I'm doing now. It's just an online store because this is 2020, bruh. Anyway, so... You can get that stuff. I guarantee you that whatever they're using, the stuff that we have in our store is just as good or better. Or it's the same. Definitely, for sure it is. So if you want to take over, that's fine. I want to um, go through a couple things, though, and I want to talk about carbon. I want to talk about getting carbon in the soil because that's really the thing you want. And I used to kind of think about, I used to know this in a way, I used to say this in my old videos, I used to say, you can look them up, I would say, the reason I use organics like Melorganite, like Ringer Lawn Restore, is because organics build the soil. Now, I didn't understand everything behind that like I do now because I've been educated by folks like John Perry. And I kind of understand a little bit more about how the soil operates and and um, and the soil food web. And I've read books like I have on my shelf back here, uh, Hands-On Agronomy and even The Secret Life of Plants and some others. And I've kind of started to learn a little bit more about some of these things. And... And I've realized that when I would say organics build the soil, it's true. But what they really do is they build soil carbon. They contribute to microbes uh, moving around in the soil and other things like earthworms. And all of these things are what makes soil life happen. And soil life is what makes the soil healthy and, and contributes to this cycling through the soil that makes your soil naturally healthy. So let me give you a key or a uh, quote here. This is from Cornell University. It's called, this is from an article, The Carbon Cycle and Soil Organic Carbon. Quote, higher soil organic carbon promotes soil structure or tilth, meaning there is greater physical stability. This improves soil aeration, oxygen in the soil, and water drainage and retention, and reduces the risk of erosion and nutrient leaching. So let me, let me just read this again. This is from Cornell University. Higher soil organic carbon carbon. So you can get that from humic acid, you can get that from biochar, you can get that from organic fertilizers. Lots of different ways to get soil organic carbon. Improves soil aeration. Huh. Oxygen in the soil, they call that. This improves soil aeration, oxygen in the soil, and water drainage and retention, and reduces the risk of erosion and nutrient leaching. Soil organic carbon is also important to chemical composition and biological productivity, including fertility and nutrient holding capacity of a field. As carbon stores in the soil increase, carbon is sequestered, and the risk of loss of other nutrients through erosion and leaching is reduced. Okay, so getting carbon in the soil, that is the key. No matter what other terms you put on it, no matter how else you want to market it, Getting soil organic carbon into the soil is what you want. Or getting, getting, increasing your soil organic carbon, that is what you want. The Scott synthetic ferts, Lesco synthetic ferts, they don't have a carbon source. This is why the stuff that we sell for the most part has a carbon source. Now, we have some fully synthetic, synthetic stuff too that we put on Yard Mastery because, again, there is a place for those. There is always a place for that stuff, okay? But we also want to get some sort of soil organic carbon in there some sort of carbon into the soil as we move along so what are the ways to do that humic acid here's what humic acid is the fully decomposed remains of living things the final endpoint of something alive that breaks down is humic the humic we get in our products comes from deposits of these humic substances called linardite shale linardite shale when you apply humic you are applying carbon to your soil and in this liquid acid form, it gets right into the soil. Small particles, they get in faster. So that's humic acid, and that is increasing carbon in the soil. Another way we do that is biochar. Biochar is defined as carbonized biomass obtained from sustainable sources and sequestered in soils to sustainably enhance their agricultural and environmental value. Biochar, a porous material, can help retain water and nutrients in the soil for the plants to take up as they grow. So those are couple different ways to get 
carbon into the soil, okay? So those are the things I would look for if you're going to take it over and do it yourself. Organic fertilizers will also do that. They have nutrients, but they also have this carbon because they contain dead things, organic things, poop, feather meal, corn meal, peat from peat moss. These are all things that will increase your organic material. Now, the key though, back in the very beginning that I said, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in one year. It takes a couple, two, three years of continually putting stuff in. I know people want to spray down everything like right now and have it happen overnight. It's not like that. I've described lawn care, especially when you're working with soils that are a, a little bit tougher, like a, uh, like a clay soil. It takes a little bit of time, like any relationship, to improve it, to make it deeper, to make it more healthy. That's a relationship. It takes time to do that. So here's my recommendation for you. If you're going to take everything over yourself, Jeff, and the first thing I would say is make sure you stick with that biostim pack. That's the base of all of the products that I do. Everything I do, the base of it is the biostimulant pack. It's got the RGS, the Humic 12, the Aerate, and the OO2 microgreen. The thing about that is the OO2 microgreen has, all of them have humic acid in them, number one, that's your carbon, but the microgreen and the RGS have the sea kelp, and uh, the humic 12 is the highest concentration of the humic acid, and then the liquid aeration goes down into the soil, breaks bonds, and helps to open up that air that we talked about from Cornell University, higher soil organic carbon promotes soil structure or tilth, meaning there's greater physical stability. This improves soil aeration. And so the thing that's in the aerate along with the potassium hydroxide is also humic acid to pack in there. So those are all of the things I recommend you use as your basis. And then from there, eat the rainbow, man. Pick whatever hybrid fert you want again like we have the carbon earth products that have some synthetic and some organic with the biochar base that the chickens have pooped on you got that love that stuff you could even use the x soil which is just straight up the biochar with the chickens that pooped on it we also have obviously other liquid fertilizers you could use um Melorganite will work i've mentioned all those so that's kind of where i would go from there if you do want to get your your soil kicked up this fall though if you really want to try to push things a little bit harder this fall and maybe give yourself a good base to go into next year, that's when I would use the compaction cure, which is going to be nine ounces per thousand of the air eight and six ounces per thousand of the RGS. This is a good time to do that in Cherville. Things are coming in. They're getting a little bit cooler temperatures. Hopefully you're going to get some rain to back you up because you want to have soil moisture present. So as those things push down, they can draw the moisture down with it. And that's going to really help you to get a good start to the year and a good start, and a good foundation. So next year in the spring, when you get things going, you'll be moving quick. All right, next. Some good questions today. Let's move over to our next one. And this is Daniel. He's got some sod in Alabama coming in this winter. Hey, Alan. Uh, Daniel here. Thanks for doing the podcast and YouTube. I've learned a lot over the past few years. We recently started building a house here in North Alabama. The lawn is going to be Bermuda grass. The house is scheduled to be completed around mid-November, so I expect the sod to go down just before then. It's not the ideal time to put sod down, so I was hoping you could give some advice on how to get it off started off right. I've noticed some other houses in the neighborhood, the builders using sod that's cut quite thin with a plastic grid below it. So given that it'll be going into winter and the sod will be cut thin, how can I make the best of the situation with regards to root growth, weed, and general survivability of the lawn? Thanks. All right, great, great question, Daniel. So I know a lot of you guys will see this where you have a new construction going and they'll sod like during the winter. So I can tell you that sodding, and I'm not sure about cool season lawns on this, but for sure with Bermuda, it's okay. They can sod when it's dormant. Uh, they can put it right down on the lawn and it'll be fine. But the key is you have to keep it watered with at least one quarter inch, two to three times a week. What you don't want is the sod to completely dry out. So you want to make sure you do keep it watered. So as soil temperatures come up and as outside temperatures come up, it'll just, it'll kind of wake up from its dormancy. It's just dormant as sod. It could be dormant in the field or it's dormant as sod. The, the Bermuda grass doesn't really know the difference. It's such an alpha. It just wakes up out of whatever cryo sleep that it's in and it goes, all right, here's where I'm at. I'm taking over, bruh. Oh yeah, you cut my legs out from under me? Too bad. I'm still taking over. That's what I'm doing. Oh, you left. You didn't leave me laying in my beautiful field of sod. You took me over and you put me in this guy's freaking front yard over here. I'm taking over. That's what I'm doing. I'm taking over. How dare you take me out of my seat, my field, and make me lay in this guy's front yard over here in Alabama. I'm taking over. 
That's how your sod's going to talk. That's how your Bermuda's going to talk. <laughs> so, but you do want to keep it watered. It needs water to, to support all that. Now, before you do get to the uh, sod portion, if you do have access to the bare ground, I would get down some humic 12, six ounces, a thousand for sure. Just get some nice humic acid in there, get things looking good, get some carbon in there like we talked about in our last in our last segment. Now, as far as the uh, that um, that mesh that's under there, I have not seen that here in Florida, but my assumption is they're doing it up there because it allows them to harvest the sod quicker. It increases the tensile strength. So the tensile strength is essentially the way the sod or the grass knits together with rhizomes and stolons. So when you pick it up, it doesn't fall apart. I'm assuming that... They put that mesh in there as a support mechanism so they can possibly harvest it quicker uh, and they don't have to wait for it to have stronger or more knit together tensile strength on its own. That is my thought. I personally wouldn't want that under my lawn. I don't, I mean, I'm assuming it's something that's made to break down, but then again, break down how, like in 10 years or like in 10 months, I don't know. So that is not something I would want there, but you probably don't have a choice. Probably all of the sod farms in your area do that. So you're probably going to be stuck with it, but that's that's essentially what I'm thinking it's for is to increase the tensile strength and tensile strength, and maybe they do that in the winter as well. Only when they know they're going to harvest for the winter, they may do that to help it to sit flatter, to not curl up um, as it does get dry wind across it. But just make sure that you do keep that water. Now it's probably going to come out of its dormancy whenever your day length gets to over 12 hours a day, approaching that. 12.5. I, I want to give you guys a, a website here I like to use. It's called sunrise-sunset.org. It's fun to go there and look at the day length because that's how our warm season turf is really dictated. Temperatures matter, but more so up north temperatures matter more. Here it's day length. And uh, we want to be over 12 hours. You get into 12 and a half hours. That's when your warm season turf will start running. I looked up Tuscaloosa, Alabama just for fun. It looks like right around the end of February is uh, when you're when you're going to be maybe into March is when you're going to be over that 12 hours of day length. So that's probably, you know, heading into mid March is probably when your sod's going to really start to wake up there. And then by the time you get to end of March, you're at 12 and a half. That's when it's probably going to be running. So once you get to that 12 and a half, like into March, 12 and a half hours of day length, that's when you're going to want to start watering it again. Now, like you would new sod, because that's the thing, right? You kind of maintenance watering it during the winter here, giving it that quarter inch every two or three days just to keep it from drying out. But then when you get to that 12 and a half hours of day length, which for you in Alabama there is going to be right around 12 and a half hours or so, Daniel, that's when you're going to want to start giving it that sod like new new sod watering. And that would be probably twice a day. Now, I would say 30 minutes, but Really what you want to do is after a watering cycle, go stick your finger underneath the sod and it should be wet down to the soil and the top of the soil should be wet. So if that's 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I mean, I don't know what your irrigation situation is like, but you want to give it two good soakings a day, one in the mid-morning and one in the mid-afternoon and water it like new sod for 30 days so it can take. And then once you've mowed it a couple times, that's when you can go onto more of a normal mowing schedule. And of course, I would also recommend you use RGS in there. And again, I'm not even talking about our buy our starter seed pack that we have, the seed starter pack. The instructions for that you use for new seed are the, exactly the same for new sod. So you could get that green pop in there, which is 21% FOSH. You could apply that at 15 ounces per thousand. And you would do that right around that same time that you start doing that normal watering at the end of March when that 12 and a half hours of day length are there and really help that sod to root in, grab in, and get established. All right. With that, I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast this week. I've missed talking to you. I hope you've learned something here. And I hope you keep things positive. Keep things moving. Keep that lawn growing healthy and green. we got a couple more months left in the season here. For most of you guys up north and for those of us down south, we still have several months left. <laughs> Please uh, continue to subscribe here. Subscribe to my channel on YouTube, The Lawn Care Nut. Hope you guys have a great weekend, and I'll see you in the lawn.